Hello everyone and welcome to the podcast of English composer Andrew Downs. I am Paula, Andrew's younger daughter, and for today's show I've had the great honour of interviewing the wonderful oboist George Caird, who was principal of Royal Birmingham Conservatoire for 17 years, starting in 1993, at which point Andrew Downs was head of composition and creative studies there. Andrew composed his sonata for oboe and piano for George for first performance with pianist Malcolm Wilson at the Birmingham and Midland Institute on the 20th of October 1995. The work was written during the months following the composer's visit to the beautiful gardens of the University of Burdwan in Bengal, India, and represents the composer's emotional response to this part of India. The Birmingham Post wrote about this work, A substantial four-movement idyll, it sounds, as in all this approachable composer's output, genuinely imagined. Its combination of Indian inspiration and ecclesiastical modality proved magical. Numerous performances of this work have taken place in the UK, Europe and the USA, notably won by George Caird and Duncan Honeybourn in a concert of music by Andrew Downs on June 21, 2005 in the Adrian Bolt Hall, Birmingham to mark the composer's retirement from Royal Birmingham Conservatoire. The Birmingham Post wrote of this performance In Downs' fantastic 1995 sonata in the gardens of Bird One, George Caird's oboe swung from raucous Indian piping to limpid English pastels, exactly as this ravishing score demanded. The Netherlands premiere was given by oboist Hazel Wright and pianist David Brock at Zwolle Conservatoire of Music on December 11, 1996. The USA premiere was given by oboist Mark Fink and pianist Todd Wellborn in Wisconsin on January 29, 2009, and these players gave the first broadcast performance on WPR Wisconsin in April 2009. There was also a performance by oboist Christopher Redgate and pianist Malcolm Wilson at the composer's 60th birthday concert at Royal Birmingham Conservatoire on November 29, 2010. And George tells me there have been many performances by students over the years, for example by oboist Emma Cowper. I am now going to play you the first movement of this work from the recording made by George Caird and Malcolm Wilson for a CD entitled 20th Century Music for Oboe and Piano in 1999 for the Classical Recording Company.
just wonderful. This CD is available at andrewdowns.com where you can also purchase the sheet music. And if you would like to read the library talk that Andrew Downs gave just before the premiere, or if you'd like to read his diary of his trip to India, then visit the About page. You can also read about the premiere and subsequent performances on the blog of his wife and publisher, Cynthia Downs. And now to our guest, the oboist on that recording, George Caird. Since 1970, George Caird has combined a career as an oboist with one as a music educationalist, firstly teaching and later in senior posts at the Royal Academy of Music, Royal Birmingham Conservatoire, Codarts Rotterdam and the Royal Welsh College of Music and Drama. George studied the oboe with Janet Craxton and Evelyn Barbarolli at the Royal Academy of Music, with Helmut Finchermann at the Nordwestdeutsche Musikakademie and privately with Neil Black. He subsequently gained an MA in music at Peterhouse, Cambridge, graduating to pursue a freelance career as an oboist. He worked with many of London's major orchestras and was a member of the Academy of St Martin in the Fields from 1983 to 1993, whilst also devoting much time to chamber music. He has been a member of a number of leading ensembles, notably as a founder member of the Albion Ensemble, Vega Wind Quintet and Care Dobo Quartet. George has been a committed teacher and educationalist throughout his career. He joined the Royal Academy of Music as Professor of Oboe in 1984, became Head of Woodwind in 1987 and Head of Orchestral Studies in 1989. In September 1993, George was appointed Principal of the Royal Birmingham Conservatoire Birmingham City University, a post that he held until August 2010. From 2011 to 2016, George was Director of Classical Music at Codarts Rotterdam, and in 2017 he was appointed Interim Principal of the Royal Welsh College of Music and Drama in Cardiff. George is married to the cellist Jane Salmon. He has five children, Adam, Oliver, Edmund, Iona and Elizabeth, Lizzie and eight grandchildren, Jonah, Miles, Casper, Isla, Eva, Rosa, Nina and Lyra. Without further ado, here is George Caird. Hi George, thank you so much for coming on our show. Hello, I'm very happy to be here. Fantastic. So can you tell us, how did you get into music in the first place and why did you choose the oboe? Thank you for those questions. Well, it's interesting because I grew up first in Montreal in Canada and I was the son of an academic. In fact, both of my parents were academics. And although we heard a lot of music and I learned the piano, music wasn't in the fore when we were in Canada. But when I reached the age of nine, we returned to Oxford in England, where my father got a job. And suddenly, the musical world opened up. Mm-hmm. I was sent to New College School, which is a choir school. Although I was never a chorister, I arrived with a broad Canadian accent mm-hmm. and rather too late for the choir trials. But my friends were choristers, and I used to go and listen to Evensong on a regular basis in New College Chapel. And if you know that, city, music is everywhere all the time. Mm. So I heard music being played and it was just a complete eye and ear opener for me as a nine-year-old boy. And then I began to learn the recorder at school with a lovely lady called Margaret Donnington, I should say, who knew the dolmetches. Mm. So I felt there was a kind of learning from the real people. Mm -hmm. And I then had piano lessons with a wonderful Greek teacher called George Kaloutsis. And slowly, slowly, it became clear that I was really passionate about music. Music. And then one day I went to my brother's school. My two elder brothers were at Magdalen College School and heard this magical concert by the river, an uh, annual madrigal concert. Mm. And two older boys stood up and played a trio sonata on two oboes. Oh. And it was love at first sight. All right. I could not believe my ears. And I can still remember the effect of these extraordinary instruments, it almost going through me. Mm-hmm. And I just determined 
determined to learn the oboe from that day. And Paula, I think it's interesting that all these years later, I still feel the same about it. Isn't that interesting? Oh, that's lovely. What a lovely story. Yeah. So I think it slowly grew and then it became apparent. I think like a lot of us, I know that your father, Andrew, he was a choral scholar, wasn't he? Mm -hmm. And I'm sure he got drawn into music. And so did you yourself, as we've just been speaking. You join youth orchestras, don't you? And then it's kind of group effect. Mm -hmm. And various of you start to really realise you want to do it. Yes. And I very luckily got into the local county youth orchestra and then the national youth orchestra. Mm. And then it starts to get serious because you're rubbing shoulders with people who really intend to join the profession. Mm. That's all that happened to me. How was your time in the national youth orchestra? That was amazing. I think the thing about that, and I'm sure it's still true, but the sheer raising of level is what happens to you. You can come from a regional setup. I still remember arriving and sitting in the middle of this huge orchestra, huger than I'd ever come across before, and playing Tchaikovsky's Fifth Symphony mm. as though it were a professional orchestra. And you're only in your teens. And you can't believe it. The sound is completely thrilling. So in a way, these are almost like the road to Damascus, isn't it? You know, the vision comes to you that maybe you could join something very, very special by becoming a musician. <laughs> yeah, oh, it must have been amazing to be in that. And then you went on to the Royal Academy. Yeah, it's interesting, isn't it? Because I was brought up in an academic family and my eldest brother went off to university and became an architect and then a town planner. Mm -hmm. But in fact, the two middle boys, my next brother, John, went into a drama school and I went into a conservatoire. And I think looking back, our parents were just wonderful people who expected us to pursue what we were passionate about. Mm. And so I I think it was a voyage of discovery for them that they had children who wanted to do these artistic things. Mm. And also, I think that it's wonderful when you have parents who eat culture or consume culture on a daily basis. Mm -hmm. So we were taken to plays and opera and concerts, and it was just the regular, you know, food of life. Sounds wonderful. I love that eat culture. <laughs> <laughs> eating, <laughs> drinking it as well. And I should say, I have a younger sister who has been an academic herself, but also very, very interested in music and the arts. And she married a very fine violin player. So it's been in the family. Oh, that's lovely. So you went to the Royal Academy and you went to Cambridge after that. What was the thinking behind going to the Royal Academy followed by Cambridge? I suppose it was my background coming home to roost. <laughs> I trained as an oboist. It was a wonderful time at the Academy learning with the great Janet Craxton, who is still seen as one of the greatest teachers we've ever had in this country. And I started freelancing already when I was at the Academy. So I felt a part of the profession. Mm. But I had this niggling feeling that somehow I wanted to do something more with my mind mm -hmm. and that maybe a degree was a thing I should get. Whether it was the right decision, I don't know, because I have contemporaries who went straight into the profession. And in a way, I can say over the airwaves now that I regard them as, you know, people who did the right thing by their own talents in a way that they got in and got jobs a little bit earlier than me. But on the other hand, looking back, because I became head of a conservatoire, I think I took on the breads of taking a bit more time mm. and really thinking about my subject and broadening my skills, perhaps, I don't know. Yeah, opened up a few more possibilities. I think so. And I think you as an academic yourself would probably realize that too. Mm, I dream of becoming a student again so I think you did the right thing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah and doesn't it teach you that in a way you remain a student because I think the notion of lifelong learning you go on acquiring skills and I think since my Cambridge days I've if anything I've become more academic as time has gone on. I enjoy researching now for instance more and more. All right. Finding things out. <laughs> Can you mention any highlights of each place? Well I think I always say that the number one thing about a conservatoire is you're studying with the professionals. Mm. So it was learning with my unbelievable teacher, Janet Craxton. It was playing in the orchestra and getting the chance of playing for some very good conductors. I remember Klemperer coming to the academy, for instance, All right. as an example. But we were trained properly. And in fact, the regular conductor who's less known these days, Maurice Hanford, 
that he was the assistant of Sir John Barbaroli. Mm -hmm. And you got the feeling of being trained to a very high level yeah. that you could really play. I remember playing in the festival hall on the 150th anniversary of the founding of the Academy. And I played first oboe in Beethoven 9 and even more significantly played in a performance of the last Mozart piano concerto with the great Clifford Curzon. Mm. And again, it was an unforgettable experience that you felt you were doing the real thing. Yeah, can imagine. <laughs> but then Cambridge, you come across other greats, don't you? I remember an amazing masterclass with Nadia Boulanger. Mm. In fact, I remember a class with Nadia Boulanger at the Academy, but particularly her visit to Cambridge when we put on a concert of her music and also of the music of her sister Lily Boulanger. Mm. And there we were playing her sister's music and Nadia was there. Wow. That was a memory. But many, many other things. And working under David Wilcox, mm. who was my supervisor, and then later on Philip Ledger. These were great musicians. Gosh, all amazing. Well, I'm now going to put on movement two of Sonata for Oboe and Piano by Andrew Downs, Cantabile.
Can you tell us about the Royal Birmingham Conservatoire and your time and experiences there? Yes, well, of course, in the interim years, after I left the Academy in Cambridge, I was a freelance oboist for a number of years. Mm -hmm. But I always taught. And I think teaching has been a very, very important part of my life. Even when I was at Cambridge, I had a few students who I was teaching oboe and actually a little bit of recorder as well at that time. But then as time went on, I was sucked into the Royal Academy of music and I became a professor of the oboe and subsequently head of department there so I think the professional link to my working in what was then Birmingham Conservatoire was my period as a head of department in a London conservatoire and that in itself has extraordinary memories not least for example the composer festivals when we actually worked with and played with Olivier Messiaen, Mm -hmm. Lutoslavsky, Penderecki, Ligeti, uh, extraordinary artists used to come in those days in the 1980s. And then one day I saw an advert on the Royal Academy of Music notice board, wanted Mm -hmm. or vacant position Mm -hmm. principal of Birmingham Conservatoire. And I just simply applied and went through the process and was amazed, I think, now looking back to find that two months later I was appointed. (laughs) And I think it was quite a nine days wonder that a head of woodwind and orchestral studies should suddenly be a principal. But why not? I thought to myself. (laughs) Yeah, absolutely. And I think that (laughs) what I found in Birmingham, it's a thing that I want to put across here, is a very, very unique organisation, a regional conservatoire that was really quite old. It was founded in 1886, with actually a history before that going back to the 1850s of great music education with terrific teachers in the past. I just think, for example, there was a violin teacher called Ernest Element, Mm -hmm. who is a kind of legendary figure. But many, many others who could be mentioned who had taught at a high level and of course people rather like the Downses actually who were produced from the Midlands are the result of this work but I think it's fair to say that the old Birmingham School of Music missed the chances the financial and economic chances that the London Conservatoires got and then it also missed the chance in around 1970 that was taken up by the Royal Northern when the great Sir John Manduel combined the two Manchester colleges got a royal title for it and started to prove that you could have a great conservatoire outside London. And I think the history of British music education would record this, that for the whole of the 70s and the 80s, the story in conservatoires was about London Royals and Guildhall and then Mm. it was about the Royal Northern having huge success as a provincial great. And then there were the other music schools. There was the Scottish Academy in those days in Glasgow. There was the rather smaller Welsh College, which was still very much undeveloped in those days. And of course, Trinity, which is in London. Mm. And the Leeds College of Music was on its way up. But I think suddenly in the 90s, the moment was ripe for the other great provincial centres to prove that they could do it. And of course, we had in Birmingham the brilliant advantage of one Simon Rattle being there. And I think he, again, 10 years earlier, he went in 1984, I think, but as a young 24-year-old, and he obviously made a pitch to say, well, look, can we not do something with a city, a second city, and make a great orchestra happen? And the rest Mm. is history. (laughs) Yeah. And I thought to myself, well, here I've been appointed, and the dream is let's see what we can do with the Birmingham School of Music to continue, and I use the word continue, to raise it from the great starts that it had had. And we need to mention number one, Louis Keras, who was a principal in the 80s, and then subsequently Kevin Thompson, Mm -hmm. now known as my friend Kit Thompson. He did a shorter stint, but Louis Keras and Kit Thompson began the relentless rise to being, in a sense, a competitive international conservatoire of music Mm -hmm. and that was huge fun to be part of i can imagine (laughs) it must have been amazing so continuing that story if i may yes do (laughs) what i found was this extraordinary organization where the 
Birmingham School of Music, then now shortly become the Birmingham Conservatoire, which was the name was changed by Kevin Thompson at the end of the 80s, had learnt that in order to compete, as it were, it had to have a different kind of set of values. It had to have a kind of unique selling point. And what it had found yeah. was, yes, let's chase the depth of study. Let's chase quality. But also let's think about breadth. Let's think about all kinds of music. Let's think about inclusivity. And I think the thing that we need to record today, Paula, in this interview <laughs> is that this is almost 20 years before inclusivity became almost like a national catchphrase, didn't it? Mm. Where we are now yeah. talking about inclusivity in a completely different way from the 20th century that we can now look back on. Yeah. When I think it was still a very, we had a very divided society. And into this frame, I think we then introduced the reasonably recently appointed head of composition, Andrew Downs. <laughs> Because what I found was here was a man who inherently understood this, mm. that what we needed to do was to reach out to the hinterland of Birmingham. Mm -hmm. We had to include everybody. Yeah. And that meant that we had to think about the musics that they wanted to play. Mm -hmm. And so we had a gamelan, didn't we? Who bought it? Andrew Downs. <laughs> we had African drums. Who bought them? Andrew Downs. And he developed his composition department and actually tacked on another name as well, Creative Studies, yeah. for this brief period, because that all came to an end, to a natural conclusion. But during the 90s, Composition and Creative Studies was a catchphrase for the Andrew Downs show, really, which was to bring together creative and, in a sense, broad-minded musicians mm. to do something really rather different from what other conservatoires were doing, to yeah. look at world musics. We appointed a head of world music, Mark Lockett, mm -hmm. and then we dreamt of having other music courses. And, of course, immediately we snapped up jazz. That wasn't original because other conservatoires were doing jazz, but we were jolly well going to do it as well. Mm -hmm. So the existing and brilliant jazz course, which Jeremy Price still runs, is a tremendous product of Andrew's support, I think. Oh, fantastic. And then, which is pertinent to our conversation here, is we thought about Asian music. Mm -hmm. Why? Because in Birmingham, there is a natural constituency of South Asian origin population. Mm -hmm. And also because it's a terrific classical music, the classical classical music of the subcontinent of India. And so Andrew, with his wonderful friend John Mayer, an Indian composer and violinist who'd spent years working in London, partly in the World Philharmonic Orchestra, yeah. but also as a composer. Indo-jazz fusions was his great ensemble. Yeah, it was amazing, I remember. <laughs> and the two of them, I think, I think they sat up there up on the top floors of the conservatoire <laughs> building, cooking plans, you know. <laughs> <laughs> and one of them was to dream of running an Indian music course. And this is what brought him to travel to India. We sent him soon after my arrival, actually. I'm amazed to look and see that the oboe sonata that we're about to talk about was written in 1994, which is a year after I arrived. Yeah, that was quick work. <laughs> Putting two and two together is Andrew must have gone out soon after my arrival and began the exploration of what it might be to create an Indian music course. And it did take a little time, but his first connection was through John Mayer with Boudouin, which is a beautiful, as I picture it, a garden city with this old university in it. Mm. So, I mean, we'll get on to that. But coming back, this was all part of the growth of the Royal Birmingham Conservatoire, which then also, by the way, developed postgraduate studies. It developed a research department, which is hugely successful now. It restarted its junior department, which is also hugely successful. And we all now know that it has already produced one BBC Young Musician of the Year. Mm -hmm. Gosh. amongst others and some enormously successful musicians there is a principal clarinet in the london symphony orchestra who is a product of the junior department for example chris richards so we fired on many cylinders yeah but i would say that for 
purposes of this interview is that Andrew Downs contributed to many of these dimensions. He wasn't at the forefront of early music, but he agreed with it yeah. because it was another broadening. Mm -hmm. His very dear friend and colleague, Stephen Dorr, who oh, was yes. a famous Bach scholar, mm -hmm. was part of the revolution that now has produced the Capel Orchestra, which Andrew was involved in getting going. I remember Stephen Dorr's John Passion. Amazing. Of course. Yes, absolutely. And of course, then that brings us back to, again, Andrew also, being a head of composition, thought about contemporary music and founded the Talline Ensemble, which was the kind of contemporary music ensemble. And this still continues to this day. Oh, great. So I think what I put across is that there were many, many people who contributed to the progress of Royal Birmingham Conservatoire, and it would take all day to list them. <laughs> but I hope people who listen to this will know that they're not forgotten, mm. that the curriculum designers, the heads of the courses, mm. incredibly brilliant people, the researchers, the instrumental departments, the heads of vocal studies, the opera, all these things we dealt with. And it was like an army of generals doing this. Mm. But coming back to Andrew is that I think what I feel is that while we relentlessly increased the level, the standard, I think, because we had to. We had to go on competing with the best conservatoires in the world. Mm. We also relentlessly pursued the breadth agenda mm. of trying to be broad-minded about music and inclusive. And that DNA, I believe, is still there in the conservatoire long after your father is retired. That's lovely to hear. And it's fascinating to hear your take on it, because obviously I know the history from my own point of view, and it was a very exciting time. It was exciting. It was creative. Creative. I mean, I still remember Andrew. I think he had a sense of ownership over the old recital hall, which was the kind of 150-seater on the ground floor of the old conservatoire building. Mm -hmm. But it was, in a sense, the old hall was very dingy by the time <laughs> I got to know it. Yeah. But every time he had his Wednesday, it was his Wednesday evening concerts, which the place would light up with all sorts of extraordinary things going on. <laughs> and of course, he had his teaching room upstairs. And again, that was always full of other instruments and, you know, <laughs> drums and all sorts of things. Yeah, his office was hilarious. <laughs> it was a creative space, wasn't it? Definitely. <laughs> but I think what we need to share with this is the energy, because he would come in full of the energy to make things happen. Mm. And I think the amount of time he spent with those students just motivating them to do their best. Mm. I think people achieved more than they ever dreamt they would. Mm. Do you think we should mention a few extraordinary students of his? He recruited Joe Broughton. Yeah, sure. Yeah, I do mention them, yeah. I mean, Joe, he still runs the folk ensemble, but Joe is a folk violin player, folk fiddler. And which conservatoire had ever admitted a folk violin player, folk fiddle player, to its B Mascos. Well, we did, didn't we? Well, Andrew did. <laughs> That's extraordinary because Joe has had an amazing career and has inspired generations of conservatoire students. There's one, mm. but many others. We'll come back to our interview in a moment, but let's just have a quick break to have a listen to movement three of Idyll in the Gardens of Bird One, Sonata for Oboe and Piano by Andrew Downs. And this movement is called Allegro Vivace. <laughs> Thank you. 
a bit on the oboe sonata can you tell us how did the composition of the oboe sonata come about thank you for asking me this because i've reconstructed a little bit in my own mind not least because we recorded it and there's a lovely program note that andrew and i probably put together on the recording which dates from 1999 i think what happened was that when i arrived we got to know each other and i being naturally like this i asked the head of composition to write me a piece didn't i (laughs) and he agreed Brilliant. But I think the other reason was that we had a very good connection with the old Birmingham Midland Institute. Yeah. And we had a tradition of playing concerts there. So students used to go on a regular basis and play concerts in the BMI, as we called it. Mm -hmm. And we have to remember that the old conservatoire years and years ago lived within the Birmingham Midland Institute. So the building was demolished. And that's why eventually the conservatoire was rebuilt back in 1970-ish. But the connection between the Midland Institute and the conservatoire remained. And so we had a kind of almost parent-child relationship (laughs) with it. So I think I agreed to do a principal's recital for the BMI. And what better than to play the first performance of the head of composition's oboe sonata. (laughs) And then, of course, as we've indicated, Andrew had gone out to Baudouin and he sat in that beautiful garden in Baudouin University. And as the programme note says, he just had this incredible feeling of joy at the beauty of India and all its natural history. And the flowers, I think he said when he came back, were just so gorgeous. Mm. And yet a kind of tinged with sadness that you walk out into the streets and you saw all that poverty. Yeah. And I think he poured into this sonata that kind of dual feeling, I think. Yeah, well, that's interesting. It's a gorgeous work. It's full of lyricism. I love the way Andrew writes instrumental music. He phrases so beautifully. The phrases are singable. And in my own mind, I've never really discussed this with him, but I think his own choral scholar past comes into his writing. He must have sung Bird and all the English madrigalists and Tompkins and all those pieces, as well as, of course, as Bach and Handel. But it's that kind of lyrical part writing that he can do. Mm -hmm. And I have always loved playing this music. Oh, that's lovely. By the way, it's also jolly difficult. Any oboist, be warned. (laughs) Andrew writes tricky rhythms. And I think that the rhythms are also in this piece are a response to kind of Indian rhythms. But I think if you look at all his output, Andrew loves cross rhythmic things, which any musician has to think about yeah. <laughs> he does so Malcolm and I had fun doing it <laughs> Oh, brilliant. (laughs) So I think that's how it came about. And then, of course, eventually, it's interesting, when the research program got underway, and of course, I felt that we performers ought to be seen as researchers. So when we started doing the research assessment exercise, which is the university's way of measuring research, it seemed to me that it would be a very good idea that we recorded the works of our composers. And so I joined the research effort in a humble way, but also this was a way 
way of actually expressing that our head of composition's works were being performed and recorded, which they were. Mm. So there was a kind of motivation yeah. to bring out this recording. And we popped dear John Mayer's Abu Sangit work on the same recording, I should say. Oh, lovely. So I think that's the background to the work. And because I've had the principal's job for all those years, 17 years, my chances to perform have been, to a certain extent, limited. I've not been a full-time professional performer because of what's happened to me, but I've relentlessly stayed a performer. But this leads to saying I'm delighted to hear from you that, in fact, and others, that, of course, other people have performed this work. Yes. My friend Chris Redgate, for instance, who's a wonderful oboe player. Oh, wonderful. And others. We're now going to listen to the final movement of Sonata for Oboe and Piano by Andrew Downs and Dante Sostenuto. Thank you. 
So what are you up to now? Are you still playing? Yes, well, I am. As I said at the beginning of this interview, Paul, the, the passion for the oboe has never dimmed with me. I love playing the oboe and I love teaching it. I love listening to it. So I'm very happy to hear these wonderful oboists that now abound in this world. And I'm very privileged to know many of them. But right now I'm freelancing. When I finished as principal at the conservatoire, I was overjoyed to be kept on as an oboe teacher because I taught in the department all those years. Oh, I see. And I have a very warm relationship with Jenny Phillips, the head of Woodwind. And I hope I do my bit in contributing to a very lively Woodwind department. I'm mm, sure you do. But I was very lucky because I retired in December 2010. And I thought, well, I'll begin to develop my freelance career. But I think it was the 4th of January 2011. I was flown at short notice to Rotterdam in the Netherlands mm -hmm. because they had a problem with their classical music academy in that they had no head of it. Oh, right. And at the end of my day in Codarts, it's called the Conservatoire of Rotterdam now, I was appointed as the director of the Classical Music Academy. Oh, gosh. And I held the post as a three-day-a-week appointment for five years. Wow. <laughs> so I flew weekly from first Birmingham and now other airports out to Rotterdam. And it was the most incredible experience, yeah. which might be another another interview. <laughs> and then since then, I've done a year as the interim principal of the Royal Welsh College of Music and Drama. Oh, wow. This was two years ago, and I loved that. They lacked a principal for a year, 2017-18, and now Helena Gaunt is the appointed principal, but I had a wonderful year filling in for them. And so, in a way, I'm making myself available to the world of music education when and if required, Yeah. as well as being an oboist and a teacher. Oh, it sounds wonderful. A wonderful mixture of things and headships as well. <laughs> yeah, I think the joke going around is that I'm trying to get a complete set of conservatoires. <laughs> 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 but I, I think I should say in this interview that there's no doubt that my long stint in Birmingham was the real job of my life. Mm. It was a major commitment, which I am just so happy to have done. Although I did do 10 years earlier in the Royal Academy of Music, and that was also a very, very creative, extraordinary period. So two questions we always ask our guests. Why is music education important? Yes. Well, it's a great question, isn't it? And I think for me, music education is really the unique developer of all people mm -hmm. because music goes to everyone. Mm -hmm. It's universal. And what I feel about music education is it has the ability of crossing borders, boundaries. Mm -hmm. So it crosses the boundaries of race, of language, of belief. It somehow inhabits the space which the conscious world can't get to. Mm -hmm. And I think it's really a tool which actually provides all of us with, in modern terminology, provides us with these transferable skills, the ability to listen, the ability to work together, mm -hmm. the ability to create things. And I think, in a way, the best music is like the ones we feel we created. Do this. We do more than teach music. We teach life through music. Yeah. So I think that's why music education is important. And I feel that conservatoires are the bridge between general music education and professional training. So they are even more responsible for the future because future professional musicians will go through future, and of course, future teachers. Of course. And our second question, why is music good for us? Your two questions are interrelated because I've given you the answer in the first answer. <laughs> Yes, yeah, sorry. <laughs> Music is universal. It's also a language which is without words. It can be with words, but it's a language which is beyond the conscious. And therefore, it inhabits the area of spirit, of unconscious thought, of emotion. And therefore, it fulfills a need. Now, you'll say to me, but doesn't that happen with art and other art forms? And the answer is yes. <laughs> but I think everyone or most people would agree that music has a special status. Mm. And I think if you go to the proms, you realise that, don't you? That somehow this mass appeal for music, I guess that mass appeal could be seen in the great art galleries where thousands of people go, the Tate Modern, for instance. But somehow music goes straight to the core of us all. Mm -hmm. And it's the music we like, so we may like different kinds of music 
music. But in the end, the greatest music is universal. I love all your answers to those questions. Thank you so much. And it has been wonderful to talk to you. It really has. I'm really grateful to you for coming on. Well, thank you for asking. And again, I know that this is a chance for me to say a big thank you to Andrew Downs for all that he's done and to say that I had an enormous honour in working with him all those years. And I look forward to further interaction with him. Oh, that's lovely. Well, thank you so much for your playing as well of his oboe sonata. It's absolutely stunning. So thank you for that. Well, thank you very much. (laughs) 